Some of what I'm going to say at the beginning uh, was in the e-sojourner, but just in case you didn't see that or read it this week, one, uh, this story um, and uh, a similar story, there are actually two uh, stories in the gospel of the boat on the lake and crossing the lake from one side to the other. Uh, and so one of the things that I wanted to check when I, the first time that I went to, uh, to the Holy Land was, you know, what, what is this Sea of Galilee or this Lake of Galilee? Uh, and, um, of course, uh, just the use of the words sea leads you to think of a much larger uh, body of water. Uh, but you can actually see across the lake, so it really is just a lake. Um, it is uh, the uh, freshwater lake, by the way, about 705 feet below sea level, uh, with the greatest depth of the lake being about 100 more feet uh, below that. So uh, to get to the Lake of Galilee, you have to go up and over and then all the way down uh, to, get it, to get to it. Um, it happens, uh, why it's so low in altitude? Because the water that goes out of it, the Jordan River that flows out of the Lake of Galilee, actually ends up in the Dead Sea, which is 1,000 feet uh, below sea level. Uh, so it is the Great Rift Valley uh, that starts in Syria, actually, and goes all the way down through uh, the uh, Jordan River Valley, Lake of Galilee, Dead Sea, down through the Red Sea, uh, and then all the way down uh, into Africa. So if you've ever seen uh, a map of Africa, the lakes in uh, the southern part of Africa are the end point, the southern end point of the Great Rift uh, Valley. Tells you that the earth is splitting apart uh, at that, uh, on that. But in any event, um, what happens is because this is, uh, it starts actually, the Jordan River starts um, at uh, the, the border between uh, Israel and Lebanon uh, in the foothills of Mount Hermon. And Mount Hermon is about almost 10,000 feet altitude. Um, I've seen snow on it, which is surprising in the Middle East. But the snows melt and the waters gush out of the a side of one of the hills at the foothills, and then the Jordan River uh, starts from there and goes down. So I've seen the whole uh, length of it. So if you could imagine, um, uh, several weeks ago, we were up north and came down uh, Route 60 through the, um, through the uh, um, Salt River Canyon or whatever it is there, the Verde River Canyon or whatever it is, Salt River. Um, and it's much like that. Uh, that the winds uh, come down through that canyon uh, with, uh, can be with such ferocity uh, that this story is entirely plausible. Uh, that uh, a lake, uh, you know, maybe thousand foot high hills around the lake, that the wind comes down and just swirls around. So, um, so when I saw that, um, I believe then the story could be true, a true story. But imagine uh, a boat, and I included on the e-sojourner a picture of a first century boat that when the water level of the Lake of Galilee was low, uh, archeologists discovered this uh, boat from the first century. Uh, and over the years I've seen it uh, where they've now got it on display. And you have to imagine uh, that the fishing boats, unlike our fishing boats, but you have to imagine that the fishing boats of that time period, so that if this is the water level, that the side of the boat is only this much higher than the water level. And the reason is because if you're trying to uh, catch fish, and there's, I, I think I've seen one, uh, one statistic that there's over 300 different kinds of fish in this lake. So it's just uh, uh, an incredibly uh, uh, fertile uh, water for fish. But in any event, to catch the fish, so you'd throw out the net, and then instead of, half, instead of lifting the net up and over the side of the boat, you would simply drag the net over the, into the boat. So that meant that by that point, the side of the boat is at water level itself so that you could, uh, could do that. So if you could imagine, it's not gonna take 
uh, a very high uh, wave for the boat to uh, be swamped. Uh, you know, a foot high wave uh, would do it. Well, if you imagine this, and, and this is one of the things I went, you know, I just, I would love to see if this is really true that there could be at least three foot high waves on this lake. Well, I, there was no storm, it was just the wind uh, that I actually did see uh, waves that high on the lake. Now, there were no boats out on the lake, so I didn't really know how they were uh, navigating the waves, but I did see waves that high. So it's entirely possible uh, that this story, short of Jesus' uh, intervention, that they would be terrified uh, of being in um, a small a boat with the waves as high as they were, with 12 people, if you can imagine, maybe more, who knows, uh, that the boat is already weighted down by the people on the boat, uh, and then the waves being three feet high, it's like they are in peril. Uh, and, you know, it says a, a distance away from the shore. Well, I don't know if they were good swimmers or not, or if they uh, even knew how to swim, uh, but they could have managed to get to the shore. But in any event, uh, so it's a little bit of a hyperbole, I suppose, in this story. In any event, uh, the focus seems to be the contrast between the fear of those in the boat and how they react and what happens when Jesus uh, intervenes. And notice, there's two levels of fear here, right? The fear that they're going to drown because this boat is ready to, uh, you know, it's not going to take much water in the boat uh, to get it to sink. Uh, but also, uh, it says they are terrified when they see who they think is a ghost uh, because, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe it was a foggy day or something like that, uh, that they're terrified both for their own lives, but terrified because of uh, this encounter uh, with Jesus. So something about this uh, fear uh, that they have um, is, is something to consider. Uh, but let me uh, suggest this, uh, that uh, perhaps not this story per se, uh, but certainly uh, the other story of the boat on the lake, that later uh, theologians, if you will, uh, talk about the boat in a very specific way. Uh, and this is adding uh, a meaning, a level of meaning to the story that is not present in the story itself. But that's okay. Uh, we can do some of that. We can uh, interpret the text uh, and apply the text, uh, not as it necessarily would have been thought of in the first century, but now how it's going to be uh, focused on. So again, just even considering the fear uh, and uh, terror of the disciples is going to add uh, an entry point for interpretation. But I want to suggest, uh, maybe for our purpose here at Chalice, that this boat, uh, in Christian uh, tradition and spirituality, actually uh, gets interpreted as the church. That if this is the boat of Peter, then you see the connection made by the theologians and spiritual writers is that Peter is in the boat and we know uh, how uh, Christian tradition develops with Peter being the leader of the disciples and the leader of the early church, the main, the first called by Jesus and therefore the most significant uh, of all of the disciples. So they uh, comment that this boat is the bark of Peter. In fact, you'll see it in iconography, early Christian iconography, uh, that the boat is no longer just a boat in a lake somewhere in the Middle East, but the boat is the church. And like that boat that's getting tossed and turned, there are plenty of times in history when the church itself seems to be tossed and turned for a variety of kinds of reasons. In fact, I just saw an article about a bishop who really believes that the boat of the church is sinking right now, uh, meaning Catholic church, this was a Catholic bishop. 
Uh, and primarily, he's suggesting that it's sinking because Pope Francis has gotten way too woke and too liberal, uh, and he's appointing way too liberal of bishops. And so this is a very conservative uh, bishop appointed by previous popes who believes that the church is going down the tubes. So his interpretation is that the boat of the church is uh, drowning and sinking, and the people are drowning and sinking. But if you want to consider this, that notice, and, and here's uh, part of the, the way I'm, I'm thinking of applying this, that whether they, it doesn't say that they actually recognize Jesus, although it's assumed, because when Peter says, uh, well, first we hear Jesus say, you know, don't be afraid, it's I, meaning that somehow or another, the intervention of Jesus into this uh, terrifying uh, place where the disciples found themselves is going to resolve the terror in them, but also calm the storms. And that seems to be uh, a part of why they, at the end of the story, say he's the son of God, because he has authority even to quell and to calm the storm of a lake. Well, that's a whole nother uh, line of thinking. But Peter says, okay, if it's you, then tell me, get out of the boat uh, and come to you across the water. Now, that just seems a bit bizarre. Uh, bizarre in the sense that such a, 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 you know, such a statement just seems beyond what's going on in the story. But here again, if we move into interpreting the story beyond, again, where maybe the first century understood it, to get out of that boat and to go across the water to Jesus takes a lot of, of um, I don't want to say courage necessarily, foolheartedly, a foolheartedness maybe, because again, to think that you can walk on the water just seems to be beyond anybody's uh, capability, let alone uh, Jesus' capability, but that's what seems to be happening. So to get out of the boat, think of it this way, that even with that boat being tossed and turned, and of course they didn't have any life preservers back then, that it is still something to hold on to, to find comfort, uh, I mean, security. You got something to hold on to. How many stories did we, do we hear fre frequently on the news that somebody is discovered uh, in the ocean floating on their boat, right? It's overturned on their boat. Uh, and there they are, you know, holding fast to the hull of the boat out in the middle of the ocean. Uh, so here, that boat is the place where at least you got something to hold on to, even if there isn't any possibility of surviving uh, this terrifying experience. So to get out of the boat means what? Well, that you're going to have to step out of that comfort place, that place of security and safety, and embark across this terrifying water, and it, you know, that, that it means that you're going to have to make a choice to either stay in the fear and the terror, even if the boat is familiar and provides some security for you, that you're going to have to step out of that place of security and safety, if you will, uh, and it also means stepping out of the fear and the terror that you're in and embarking on this movement towards Jesus uh, that you have no idea what's going to happen. And, and that's a part of it, right? That oftentimes uh, in fear or, or terror that you really don't know, uh, one, how to get out of it necessarily, or that if somebody makes a suggestion to you, come across the water, you have no clue if that's really going to keep you safe 
or resolve the fear and the terror that you see yourself in. And so Peter embarks across this, the Christian community embarks, you see it has to get out of that safety, place of safety, security. It's like stepping out of the church, if you will, in order to have some connection to Jesus. And that takes a lot, right? And here I'm even pushing the interpretation further, if you can figure out where I'm going with this. That it takes a lot that we surround ourselves with uh, dogmas and doctrines and creeds, that we surround ourselves with traditions uh, and rituals, uh, and um, after a long period of time, we become quite uh, comfortable uh, and uh, find security in that, in those dogmas, and even structures. I, I told that story last week or the week before, my friends back in St. Louis, and now having to give up their very large church buildings and to embark on a journey to a strange, unknown church uh, where it's going to be different for them. But you see that stepping out of that world that we create, that we call church, involves not only the spiritual practices and beliefs that we have, but also the, the physical safety and security that four walls and a roof provide for us, that it gives us all of that, and we begin to think that that's exactly all that church is. That we begin to think that the dogmas and doctrines and rituals and traditions and structures are all that church can possibly be. And maybe that's a part of the fear and the terror in the disciples in the boat because they know that they might have to abandon the boat in order to be saved. And that does seem to be what Peter is doing. He abandons the boat in order to be saved. But notice that a part of the way he looks around and he goes, oh my God, what am I doing? And he begins to sink. And, you know, you guys made a choice and a decision a couple of years ago, three years ago, right, to embark upon stepping out of the boat, if you will, into a world that was not clearly defined or identified at that point, that you just said, this is what we have to do, and maybe you didn't have a plan, and maybe you didn't have it well defined, and maybe you had no clue in the world what was ahead, but you did it, and you stepped out, and, and then last summer we all thought we were on the verge, right? And there we were, sinking down into the water. So that now, you know, not that we have yet abandoned, uh, or I shouldn't, the word abandon is not a good one. Uh, maybe now we have yet to be forced to let go of the comfort and security and the safety that we have identified as our church community for the past number of years. But here's the thought that Jesus grasps Peter by the hand and they get into the boat and everything's okay. Well, that's easy said than done, right? And, and I'm not, I don't want to make it so simplistic that if we just accept Jesus, everything's going to be fine. Because that's not enough, in a sense. It's not enough because it doesn't answer all those un answerable questions. So what do we do? How are we going to do it? Where are we going to go? And you know what Jesus' response might be to that? You're human enough. You're intelligent enough. You're capable enough. You're smart people. You figure it out. And know this, that I'm going to be there. 
each step of the way. I'm not going to give you the answers. I'm going to, in fact, raise more questions for you. Uh, but you have to do this because you have to trust that where you are now in this journey across the lake, and it's not clear yet because you see they've come, think about it, they've come from this uh, abundant feast on the hillside, and they're actually in the boat headed, believe it or not, to the other side of the lake, and if you don't know that, the other side of the lake is not Jewish territory. The other side of the lake is Gentile territory in Matthew's world, or in Mark's world anyway. To go from, you see we're in the middle of the lake, and so either we're going to turn back around and go back to the whole of what that world is about, or we're going to proceed across the lake to a land that is not only strange, but is filled with people who don't think, believe, look, act, or even understand reality in the same way that we do. For Jew in the first century, that's exactly who the Gentiles were. People who don't act, they might not even be human, we don't know because they're not like us. And so we're headed in that direction, over there to a place that is increasing our fear and terror, perhaps, because it's so uncertain. But you see, the experience of this moment in time is meant to sharpen our senses and awarenesses that if we do get paralyzed in fear and want to stay where we are, okay, I suppose that's a choice. But you see, the reign of God might be over there. The reign of God might be over there in that place of uncertainty where there's strange in people that we don't even know what their thoughts are or their views are or what their beliefs are and may not share what we have or may even want what we've got. But that's the journey that has to be made if we're going to truly embrace and experience the fullness of the reign of God.